All right, we are recording now. Uh, so I'll start from the beginning. Welcome, everyone. This is, I think, our fifth COVID meeting uh, online. Um, the uh, the picture you see is the launch of March 2020, uh, launch of the Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity helicopter to Mars. The other big event this past month was, of course, the splashdown of the two astronauts uh, aboard the SpaceX, the Dragon capsule, which has now completed the first commercial launch and recovery uh, of, uh, of astronauts. And so that was that was the demo. They call it the Demo 2 flight. And, uh, and at the end of September, they're supposed to have what they call the Crew 1, which is the first official uh, launch to folk of uh, American astronauts to the space station as part of a regular program. Um, okay, so with that, we'll continue here. Uh, these are the members of the board. Uh, I'm Dave Faulkner. I'm up at the top there. In the middle is Vault Treber. He's the vice president. The treasurer is uh, Matt there at the top right. Trina at the bottom left is our secretary. And our two board members at large are Gunner and Conrad. So. Uh, let's begin with the treasurer's report. Matt, you want to walk us through this? Yeah, you'll have to bear with the uh, noise from the floor cleaner if it comes back again. But So, okay, I think the uh, way to do this is just to kind of talk through it. Uh, total cash in the system here is $129,876.88. Um, and then uh, that is divided up between the TCF main account, uh, which we do most of our work out of, and, uh, and the uh, PayPal account, which we mostly get. Uh, the people, I'm sorry, the background noise is starting up again here. But the, uh, we could use the PayPal account to receive membership payments mostly, and we sometimes buy and sell equipment through that. Uh, I don't have an update for Amazon Smile, but that amount is not in addition to all of this. This is money that's directly deposited into the TPF account. The most notable um, expenditure that we had was uh, we had needed to pay our astronomical lead dues last month, and so that was 26.20, and that's per person. I don't remember what that comes out to. Was it five dollars per person or something like that? I, I think it's ten. It's five dollars per person. Yeah, there's, I think there's a ten dollar one time uh, annual fee, and then five dollars per person. I think. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, there wasn't anything else notable at this point. We are getting close, I think, to starting on the dome repair. So the the amount that's shown in there as dedicated fund balances was actually, uh, let's see, that was, um, that should cover the rest of that because that was an insurance payment. The yellow roof, roll off roof was the one I was mostly thinking about where we had some bids in and we're discussing that. So that amount of money that's showing there, 14000 is just a donation towards that, but there will be a larger expenditure to um, finish the project, hopefully this fall, right, Dave? Uh, well, yeah, we, we hope to pull the trigger on that pretty soon because we need to get it done, and it looks like it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six weeks to get the entire repair done, depending on weather. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we need to pull the trigger on that uh, pretty soon. We had a meeting this past week with one of the contractors to kind of uh, talk through it. We do have bids from other contractors, and so we're we're very close to uh, uh, making a decision on that and and uh, moving forward with it. Yep. Okay. So our total membership as of July first was five hundred and twenty-six. People, did I update the data? Actually, on that, that might be August first. That's that's a, yeah. that's a August first. I that was my, I, my I, error. I, well, yeah, or mine. One, one of our two. Anyway, that that's actually the August first. Yeah. Uh, number. So, okay. Any questions on that? Which is really nice because um, throughout the COVID nineteen, uh, our our membership numbers have have remained pretty stable. So, which is yes. uh, which is good. Hey guys, this is Suresh. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, for the don't the dome repair at ELO, has that thought been given to delaying that till after Mars gets by? Because that's going to bring in a lot of um, inquiries and people wanting to uh, use the equipment out there is when Mars is brightest in two months. 
if it's going to take four to six weeks, you're going to run right into that. Um, we are, uh, but we need to get it done. And we it doesn't affect Sylvia. It only affects uh, Onan. So we'll still have the 8-inch TMB available, which is probably the best telescope to look at Mars with. Uh, yeah, but I'll be the only one available for, you know, that I demand. I, I understand that. Um, but um, I think the because you know this this was a this was the, there was a substantial donation to that from the Onan Foundation itself. I do think that we need to get this done this year. So you know, Shresh, it, it, it's a point we can consider that, but I I don't want to delay it until next year. And so uh, I think I think we're just going to go ahead and move through with it. it. It's you know if it only takes yeah it's, it's uh, that's not till October, right? Or is it September? When's the opposition? Uh, October 13th. It should be done by then. You got two months. Just if they're, yeah. they're not going to start it for another few weeks, you're going to run right into that. Yeah. So I, we might run into it. Well, we have a lot of good club scopes, you know, member scopes that we can augment with too, some big dots yeah. and other things that are comparable to what's in the dome right or in the uh the baby uh, pop and we bear. still have we still have the 20 inch if we can we can keep available too so uh, and the one I, that I, out I, at else at cgo is cgo as well well he's yeah he, he's talking about specifically um the, the public star parties I think. public nights ah. hmm. but i think if you know um um, you know, we, we'll still have the TMB and we'll have the 20 inch that we can roll out. So I, I'm, we need to get this done. So. Hey, hey, Dave, for the benefit of the group, could you just, Brandon, could you explain again what, what they're doing at the yellow roll off rough? Yeah. So, um, in, in the, the way the roll off roof is right now, it's, it's a C channel and there's, and there are rollers that are embedded in the wall of the, of the observatory. And as you, rolls off uh, it, what we've been experiencing and lately is that it's been kind of binding that the roller the, things have shifted a little bit and the rollers are no longer in line and so it, it's getting harder and harder to roll the roof back and forth at times it, it takes two people at, as a, at a minimum and sometimes four people to get it to roll off right so what we're doing is we've redesigned the uh the whole roll off mechanism so that the rollers are now will, will now be on the roof itself and it will roll off on a track a, a uh, angle track um, that will be ex that will and we're going to add additional uh, wall to support that track all the way along there so it should make it much easier to roll the roof back and forth and uh, will be supported the entire way uh, on on track uh, instead of you know kind of passing from one pulley to the next or not pulley one wheel to the next the way it is now if if anyone wants to know more about that um i've you know, i've got the plans we can give you to you but that's basically it is that we're just changing the way that it's that it's rolling off from the c channel and the wheels embedded in the wall to the wheels being on the roof itself and then rolling along a track that's supported the entire way. Yeah. Thanks Dave. That's awesome. What a great update. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Lunar scope program. Anton, you want to just talk briefly about that? Sure. I am here. Okay. So um, the lunar scope program has been very, very busy. Um, again, for the members who wish to borrow a telescope, and the, the request form is on our website under Members, Loaner Scope Program. There's a form to fill out. We're um, making your first three choices for our one of our dozen telescopes. We also have those um, DVD astronomy short courses that you can request in the text box. Okay, all that said, um, um, so far, those of you who like numbers, we've loaned telescopes 39 times so far this year. Oh wow! And, and we have a uh, about a half, half dozen or so members waiting for telescopes. So they've all been out. Um, most of them are out right now, and most of them have waiting lists. The only telescope that's immediately available is the Coronado 
solar scope. Um, there will be, be some more coming available later in the month. So if you wish to borrow a telescope, get your request in early so that I can get you on whatever waiting list is appropriate. Um, one of just, just a little comment. Um, you were talking about um, um, membership a few minutes ago. This loaner scope program seems to be um, a real membership draw. I think Steve will probably confirm that I will get an email request at three o'clock in the morning from somebody who just joined and then requested a telescope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there have been quite a few new members who have joined specifically for borrowing telescopes. Okay. Any questions? Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Okay, upcoming celestial events. Uh, we have on August 9th uh, a moon uh, Mars conjunction. Uh, there's also an occultation, not here. It's actually in southern South America. Uh, then on August 11th is the last quarter moon. August 12th, of course, is the peak of the Perseid meteor shower. It's uh, rated as pretty good. Uh, we've uh, the moon. The moon's 47% full, I think, and it doesn't rise until like one o'clock. So, uh, so your zenith hourly rate from 60 to 100. Um, and August 13th, Venus is at uh, greatest western elongation, so it'll be highest in the morning sky at 45.8 degrees. Uh, well, that's how far away it is from the sun. I don't know if that's it'll be exactly that high in the sky, but depends on the angle of the ecliptic. Um, August 19th is a new moon. August 25th is first quarter moon. And then September 2nd is the full moon. Is there anything else we need to talk about? If uh, people are out looking at the comment tonight, I'm not sure if it's going to be clear enough, but it's right next to M53 tonight. There's actually been some nice pictures already posted on the internet about that. So people get a chance to see the comment tonight, look for like right to that cluster. All right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. The August star parties. So we have our impromptu star parties with the uh, site COVID-19 uh, rules. Uh, see the site forums for those. That's been going very well. I've been monitoring the forums and uh, you know the, the invitations go out and people sign up for that. That all seems to be going very, very well. Uh, so we'll continue with that. Uh, then we have the public star parties on August 8th and August 27th, 22nd, which is reservation only through through the forums. Um, my understanding is August 8th, uh, do we need some volunteers for that? Is Merle on? Yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> Yeah, if you're a key holder and you can help out, uh, let me know. Okay, we've we've really set that up nice. Why don't you talk a little bit about some of the uh, uh, measures that we've taken to make it as safe as possible, just so people can feel a little more comfortable about coming out and and uh, volunteering. Oh, okay. Um, well, again, we uh, as I mean, we, want, we limit the attendance. So like, first of all, we're limited to how many people? Right. Is it, is it thirty, including? The volunteers um yeah yeah about right about 30 i cut off registration at 24 25 um and uh we have the i think, ability I think it's 30 to... people including the volunteers and if we have five volunteers i think i think we figure on five volunteers um we um if, if there's anybody out there with their own telescope of course we space them out uh and we try to and we have of a flow set up through the observatory so that people can maintain social distancing while they're waiting for the telescopes. Uh, when they get to the telescopes, I believe uh, Dave Johnson can probably confirm this. There's a little, we have a little plastic uh, protector that we've put over the eyepiece. Um, and it has a hole in it so that, you know, it, it doesn't block your view. And uh, it, it keeps people from having their eyes actually touch the eyepiece. But of course, I think we have goggles as well that we can sell them uh, to keep uh, their eyes from actually touching the eyepiece. And we are, you know, we, we wipe things down afterwards and 
Uh, so that, I think the whole, and of course it's outside to begin with, which is a, a better environment to begin with. So I think all in all, there's been a lot of preventive measures put in there to make it as safe as possible. So I would encourage those who are key holders out there to, to volunteer uh, for you know the August 8th or August 22nd uh, star party to help out. Um, I, I'm assuming that it's it's full. I don't know. Uh, I haven't checked the forms to see if they've got a uh, a complete uh, a, a full uh, complement of people coming to those star parties, but I wouldn't be surprised. A question um, on Please, those IP about those on those eyepiece protectors. Is that uh, okay. and then like we a, have the Northern Night Star Fest and Ken, you want to talk about that? I can. Did you want to deal with that question first? Someone was asking a question. Yeah, I was trying to ask a question. Uh, on the eyepiece protectors, is that uh, like a homegrown design or a purchased product? I'm just thinking, you know, in a, when we deal like with uh, our personal, uh, our so, personal activities, it might be nice to have something like that. Um, what I don't know about that, and, and Ken, if you can get on, it'd be great, is if there's any availability left on that. Uh, and I think that there was going to be some final decision as to whether or not it was going to go, but I haven't heard anything that uh, says it's not going to go. Yeah, can you hear me? This is Ken. Right. Dave, can you hear me? We can hear you, Ken. I don't know if he can hear Ken's anybody. Talking. I think he's hearing him. Okay, so anyway. Uh, the can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Um, North uh, the uh, NNSF. Um, it's still on, from what I know. Um, I have actually been trying to get a hold of Courtney uh, for about two weeks up there uh, to get final details, and I've left messages and stuff, and I have not gotten any calls back. So. Um, I'm assuming it is still on. Uh, we're allowing one person per room, and they have 29 rooms, so we're limited to 29 people. I wanted to know how many people were registered for tonight's meeting, but I uh, was not able to find that information out. Um, they are going to have refrigerators and microwaves available for use. Not sure where they're going to be placed yet. Um, assuming there would be um, stuff to clean them in between people. Um, no food is going to be provided by the Long Lake Conservation Center, so everybody needs to bring their own food or go to the local restaurants um, and pick up food. Um, bring your own um, plates and napkins and all that stuff. Just prepare like you're going to go camping yourself is kind of, uh, what it's going to be. Um, no public lectures or anything will be going on, although we've talked about doing Google Meet like we're doing tonight um, for a couple events. Um, and that pretty much covers it. We do offer camping this year. You can bring an RV and park it. Uh, there's no 30 amp plugins, but there's uh, 20 amp plugins. Um, the RV people would not have a shower to use. There's no shared shower facility allowed. Where is that located, those, those sites? The, the RV sites? Yeah. Um, they, you can park them in just the parking lot, the normal parking lot, and there's a power hookup there. Okay. Um, there's a couple power hookups in the gravel parking lot across from the field the garage itself, the field. Yeah. And then I think down by the Markham house, they had another spot where you could set up uh, okay. down there. And then down by the Markham house, they also say that you can put up a tent, some tents there on the South side of that. Okay. Yeah. I know. I know what they're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, so, so uh, when do you expect to hear from Long Lake on, on whether it's a go or no go? I mean, uh, we're well, to go, right? 
I'm assuming it's a go. Yes. Um, I have actually called um, Jim the maintenance man today and left him a voicemail to tell them to get a hold of me. Um, so I'm assuming that since it's kind of closed, that there's nobody manning the phones or anything right now. Um, and that it's um, going to be just kind of open for us for this star party. Okay. Sounds good. Any questions? All right. Ken, what time does what time does it open up on the first night? That's Tuesday, right? The eighteenth. Is that like four o'clock? Yeah, you can probably get there at any time, really. Um, I'm gonna I'm planning on getting there early, you know, at like noon or something. Um, so I'm gonna send an email to all of the attendees um, as soon as I can get a hold of LLCC and get that list of who's registered and what their emails are. Um, I'll get an email out to everybody for cool. de with details. Thank you. Hey, as always, Ken, this is Brandon. Thanks for all the volunteering you guys do. This is a Herculean effort, so way to go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. Public service announcements. All right. So first one is the Planet Imagers Night at ELO. Uh, that's tomorrow night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so sure look, it is. looking at the weather, looking at the weather, I'm not sure if it's going to happen. Um, I'm going to look at the weather forecast uh, when it updates in the morning to make the final call, and I'll post it on the forum. Okay. But as of now, I don't think, you know, based on what I see right now, I don't think it's going to be clear tomorrow night. Okay. All right. So you'll reschedule it for some other time then? Yeah, I'll look to see what a good date is. It'll probably be in September. Yeah, well, yeah, you got to get past LL, uh, the Northern Nights and all that. So, all right. Um, so, Committee for Updating Minnesota Astronomical Society Articles of Incorporation and Bylaws, also known as the Constitution. So, the chairperson of that, um, is a chairperson is needed to to help work with the rest of the committee to complete the documents and cross the finish line. Um, the chairperson um, that was in charge of it during the COVID and all that kind of kind of went dormant and um, is not able to complete that work. So this really close right now. Uh, my understanding, I um, my understanding is that they got to incorporate a few notes that uh, were still outstanding on that. And then uh, basically just you know, complete the work on that. And then we have to go through a couple of hoops. Uh, the board has to approve it. And I want to run it past our legal, uh, 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 our, our attorney to make sure everything uh, is good. And then um, then we'll have to schedule um, a meeting with, uh, a business meeting with the, with the uh, members at large to, uh, to be able to, uh, vote and approve that. So um, I, I need somebody who's uh, willing to take that over the finish line. If uh, if you're interested or think you can do that, then please just uh, drop an email to president at mnastro.org, and we'll uh, we'll get we'll get you uh, uh, hooked up with uh, the the old the old chairperson for for our turnover and get that done. Any questions? Okay. Any other public service announcements? Wow. I'm amazed. Mark, Job, are you on? You always have a public service announcement. All right. I do not have one because we postponed our astrophotography workshop. So we're done. Until next <laughs> okay. week. Sounds good. Although I will say that um, and I, I don't have a slide in here on this, but uh, the um, imaging rig down at Cherry Grove is very close to uh, operational. In fact, they're, they're going to be scheduling some training later this month. Uh, and it's 
it's been set up for the the, the Takahashi uh, refractor, and it is. Uh, my understanding is that it's pretty close to plug and play. You just bring down your flash drive and plug it in, and and uh, fire fire up the system. And... Dave, do you want me to talk about it just briefly? Well, yeah, that'd be great. So I've been working closely with Doug and the rest of the team um, to get that get that rig running. Um, it, it's uh, uh, you're right. It, we are we are trying to make the Takahashi um, definitely plug and play. You show up with uh, your your uh, USB drive and plug it into the laptop that's there um, and fire up the system and open the roof and get them out going and basically it's going to be as simple as uh, entering your object that you would like to take a few images of and then uh, uh, slewing to the target and then you slew to the target uh, and then uh, you know, it'll go from there. Uh, hopefully we have a couple bugs to work out. I think we got them. Uh, I think uh, we had a good night here the other night, even though it was cloudy and not very nice. Uh, Doug and I were on the phone till well after midnight. Uh, he was down there working on it. Uh, so we think we got it. Um, we just need a better night. Um, it was cloudy, so we were getting errors be because of those clouds. So we think that sometime this month um, yet, we're going to offer some training. And uh, that way, it'll be ready to roll. And then we are working on finding a camera for the plane wave. Um, we're down to two or three um, cameras that we're looking at yet. Um, I don't think we've made a final decision. Um, Doug and I have talked about it. I don't know. What, I don't know where that's sitting with him and the rest of the team. So that's where we are. Thank you. That sounds uh, good. Dave, Dave, this is Doug, so I'll talk a little bit about that. We do have uh, some training planned. I have I, I set that up today for August uh, 21 and 22, uh, 21 being the date, 22 being a backup date. We prefer this to be a um, clear night uh, event so people can actually get some pictures. So I've, I've uh, offered the... Um, the training to those that were trained last year because the system has changed enough. So uh, uh, I've offered it to them. They got, I'm going to give them a week to sign up. Uh, other than that, I'm going to, if there's still uh, spots uh, open, then I'll uh, offer it to the rest of Moss, probably through the imagers uh, uh, forum. Okay. So, uh, and I, I would assume that you're going to have like a step-by-step -step uh, guide on on how you uh, how you get you know come in and get the roof open and get the system set up and get going and and uh, uh, so a person can literally it's cook I, I call it a cookbook it literally goes through the cookbook to get set up and point it to an object the uh, the yes we do have a cookbook however uh, if imaging has taught me that there are things that kind of go wrong and you kind of have to figure out on the fly what's going on. So uh, uh, while there is a cookbook there, a procedure that that, uh, that the team has been working on, um, it's, you know, you still uh, might run into stuff and it's awfully disappointing to uh, drive out that far, try to get the system to work and then all of a sudden you're not sure what to do. We do have a troubleshooting section in back, but it's not populated uh, uh, very much at this point and we'll get more populated as people run into things. Well, I think, I think these early uh, training sessions will help to ferret out any kind of uh, uh, issues that you, you know, maybe as an experienced imager wouldn't have thought about, so to speak, and, and uh, be able to uh, address those as we go through. So, yeah, no, I, I totally understand that. Sure. So, so, so question, Doug, uh, yes. does this training make you a CGO key holder or is it part of the, you're just redoing CGU key holder training or something? Um, I, uh, I have uh, sent a message out to uh, Steve and to Vic uh, asking uh, uh, if uh, somebody could be down there to do some uh, training uh, for CGO because I can only really train or we can only really train on the imagers rig. Uh, so uh, I have that, I have that out there. Yeah, I think, um, 
you know, since you have to get into the observatory to use that, I, I think a prerequisite would be that you're a CGO key holder in order to be able to use it. Yes, that is a prerequisite. Thank you. Hey, Doug, as a Suresh, have you guys given any thought to dates after this that weekend? Because uh, some people may be at uh, Northern Night Star Fest that weekend. Um, no, we're going to do it that weekend. Uh, there will be another training session, I hope, in September and in October. Yeah, sure. I, I thought about that, too. Uh, because of the limited number of people that are going to be allowed to come to Northern Nights, I thought there's probably still going to be people around that would be willing to take the training. Hey, hey Doug, this is Brandon. I just I thank you for your leadership on this imaging rig. I'm just so thrilled as a Ch CGO committee member of all the help you've done and Mark and everybody that's been involved. So way to, way to go. I just want you to know, as you're working on the cookbook, I, I'm actually the guy to put the visual rig cookbook together. And I certainly can share this off copy with you of all the instructions to opening and closing the dome, which you'll probably want to add to your imaging rig instructions as well. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and thank you, Brandon. Uh, and the other members are, there's myself, there's uh, Mark Job, uh, um, Robert Miller, uh, Jim Knudsen, and Conrad Sanders uh, is the team. Well, we want to thank them because I know that's been a long road uh, going down this and uh, there have been uh, some fits and starts with it, but it sounds like it's finally coming together and appreciate your work on that. Uh, yours and the whole team's work on that, because I, I know it's been a team effort. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as usual, call for Gemini articles. Uh, you have something interesting, uh, piece of equipment. Um, I'm actually going to be doing in a, a little Ed Gemini article myself on a repair of a uh, uh, my tenant Schmidt Newtonian. And uh, so if you've got an article, you know, something that you want to just write about, uh, send in a couple of pictures. Uh, you can send them in to Father Brown. The articles will be due by September 10th for the October issue. Okay. Astronomical League, Jerry Jones, MAS, Astronomical League Coordinator Extraordinaire. Are you on the line? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, good evening, everyone. Nice to uh, nice to see you all, or sort of zoomingly see you all. It has been a rather um, busy a busy time in the neighborhood of uh, of of observing, which is really great. Um, any of you who have attempted to try to purchase any astronomy gear recently uh, have, I'm sure, have run into the issue of that. One of the advantages of COVID is that the uh, the public is. Growing has has an, an, a renewed interest in astronomy and, and using purchasing astronomy gear, and so we have a number of people who have over the course of the last couple of months completed some some projects, and I hope that uh, there are many more in the hopper. Uh, Don Winseth finished his Lunar One. Congrats to you, uh, Anton Gregory completed two of them. He completed his Two and a View recently and his Solar System, which also because he had done his uh, his Northern Constellation Hunter. Uh, earlier, he is now what's considered a an observer, which is one below his master observer, but it's necessary as part of the whole progress of going up from uh, master observer to advanced observer to silver and all that kind of stuff. And lastly, uh, John Zimich uh, earned his binocular double star recently. So that's all really pretty cool. And I would encourage you guys to uh, to be thinking about some of these projects that you can do at home, you know, like the urban is a great one. Lunar one is a great one. Those of you who have finished lunar one, uh, consider lunar two. I put recently on the website, on the on the forum, a, a link to Matt Waddell's uh, lunar two book, which is really wonderful in wanting to complete that. And even if you're not interested in completing it, if you want to get a list of, of a bunch of really interesting lunar objects to look at, uh, they're they're pretty pretty incredible, and they're they're all on the list for a particular reason, something unique about them. And uh, he has it lined up by days. So if you're looking at Lunar Night Four, for example, uh, you can download his free book, uh, and uh, he'll get there'll be a list of some interesting things to look at. They're difficult to find, but they're interesting things to look at on every single one of the nights. So 
so that's pretty cool. So that's all I have, unless somebody has any questions. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it. You yeah, bet. My pleasure. Jerry, what yes. all what are all the programs that you need to complete in order to, be, to become a master observer? So you need ten. Uh, the, there are five required, and then there and then there are five that you can choose. The five required. Okay, let's see if I can get them, even though they're not in front of me. Uh, the Messier honorary. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> the Messier uh, binocular. Um, double star. Uh, help me out. Somebody else is. Let's say, uh, what else? Is are Herschel there? one? The, uh, no, Herschel. Herschel is not a request. Uh, oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Herschel. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Thank you. Herschel four hundred, and then there's one other one. Uh, Lunar one. Lunar, Lunar one. one. <laughs> no, no one's been talking about that this evening. <laughs> so yes, those five. Thank you all for helping me out. Duh. Uh, and uh, and then and then five of your choice. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a great it's a great list of things that give you kind of an overview uh, of what it like what it's like to be a well-rounded observer. Okay, thank you. You bet. All right, and as usual, we want to make sure to encourage everybody to go get out there and observe. Uh, thank you for having that that one right there ready for me. Thanks very much, Dave. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> Okay, uh, before we get to our featured speaker, the next monthly meeting will be Thursday, September 3rd. Uh, it will be another online meeting. Uh, the uh, Fairview Community Center is, uh, will not be opening by then. I don't know when they're going to open up again, quite frankly. So I think you can anticipate online meetings for the near future. And, uh, of course, see the main, uh, the MAS main page for any details about the meeting. Okay. Anything else before we turn it over to our featured speaker? All right. So our featured presentation tonight is from Tom Field. He is a Sky and Telescope contributing editor. The title is You Can Almost Touch the Scars. So I'm going to stop presenting here, Tom. And uh, if you want to get in there, do you have something to present, I assume? I do. Good evening. So uh, I haven't used the Google Meetings in quite some time. So if I stumble around a little bit, I hope you'll help me out here and forgive me. Uh, now that you've changed my screen, I need to figure out how to uh, share my screen. So uh, oh, there it is. now, got it. OK. Yeah. And we're in. Good. Let me just make some changes here. So I assume you can yeah. see now. Can, yes. you, can you see me now or no? Can anybody see me? I can see you, yes. Okay, great. It's nice if I'm not just a disembodied voice. Good evening. <laughs> what an amazing turnout. This is really one of the largest club meetings I've uh, participated in. Congratulations. I, I saw on your site that, uh, or maybe Ahmed uh, had mentioned that you were uh, the largest club in the state, and I can see why. My goodness. So um, I'm a contributing editor at Sky and Telescope. I've been doing uh, astronomical um, imaging and observing for about 30 years, which means I'm a newcomer compared to a lot of you. I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes, uh, talk about some of the things I've been up to, and uh, then we can do Q&A until you drag me off the stage. Um, I think probably the best thing, in your, depending on how you all handle things, uh, is just to wait on questions till the end, uh, and then you can, uh, or maybe text them to whoever's running the meeting. I don't know quite how you organize things. Does anybody want to jump in and mention that? Well, um, to be honest with you, you're the first real speaker we've had. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so um, I think that uh, uh, people can either put them into the chat and we can handle them at the end or just wait until the end. That'll be fine. Okay, great. Terrific. Uh, nicely run meeting so far. Very crisp and um, moved along quite nicely. So uh, let's get started. How is it that we've managed to discover so much about the universe when we really just haven't even stepped outside our own neighborhood or even our houses? Of course, images can show uh, the universe in two dimensions. And by the way, this Hubble Deep Field is the size, uh, a piece of the sky the size of a tennis ball held at arm's length, if you weren't aware of that. And we can get fleeting glimpses of a third dimension, right, during eclipses. And also, if we wait a while, we can see, especially you can spot it in the upper right-hand corner, but also elsewhere on this image, some stars going on and off. Uh, as I hit the forward and back keys are not really varying in period, uh, the standard candles. But if we spread the colors out, we get an as-if fifth dimension. 
I love this just from the aesthetic standpoint. I, I sometimes I look at it and go, well, now where does this blue become green? You know, is it like right here? It sort of looks, but anyway, in addition to the aesthetics, these spectra are like a barcode for stars and help us understand a lot of things about them. So we're going to look at some examples of this tonight and the kinds of things you can do. Now, even if you're uh, not an imager, maybe you're an armchair astronomer and don't even get out under the sky and uh, look at stars. Still, uh, in understanding what we're talking about and, and listening tonight, I think you'll pick up a really good foundational knowledge that helps you appreciate some of the things that we all read in the magazines and online. So there's lots of things that these spectra can tell us. So what, what the stars are made of, how they're moving through space, radial velocity is spinning if they are, their temperature, where they are on the HR diagram and uh, their distance. So. This screen's gonna have more words than you'll see on any screen tonight, but as I've been giving these talks, I realized I had certain key points I wanted to communicate. So I thought I'd just lay them out here so you saw the, the ideas that I'm hoping that you come away with. First of all, you might wanna capture star spectra if you remember that thrill, the first image you took of the moon. If you were an imager and you remember that, yours was probably like mine, uh, blurry, <laughs> overexposed, you know, just a mess. And the thing is, it was still the most beautiful astronomical image I'd ever seen. And I was showing it to my wife and friends and colleagues. And that thrill goes away after a while. I think our minds are thrill, spe thrill spe seeking and they get tired of it after a while. So I found that by picking up a new activity like this, I recaptured that excitement, which I had early on. Maybe you wanna do a little science, uh, recreate some discoveries like we'll look at tonight, maybe even do some uh, pro-am uh, projects where you're contributing to professional amateur collaborations. My wife, I call her my credit card scrutineer. And uh, neither of us like the risk of buying new equipment when I'm not sure I'm going to use it. And all of you probably don't either. And I think you'll find the things I'm going to talk about tonight start out very inexpensive. And like most things in astronomy, can get more expensive as we get deeper in. This may be the most significant point, and that is when you own the data, you have a very different relationship to it than when you're looking at it in a magazine. You know, you're interested, you may do some reading online, and, and it sticks instead of going in one ear and out the other. So uh, that has really uh, deepened my relationship uh, to uh, understanding some of the science behind what we're doing. Uh, and what we do with uh, spectroscopy does not require a dark sky site. It's much more immune to urban light pollution than other kinds of imaging. So some amateurs will just do it on their driveway where they would never think of imaging on their driveway or from their driveways. Um, and thank God you don't need a PhD in astrophysics. I think this is one of the barriers people have in mind that I don't have a four year degree in any sciences, but you don't need a PhD. You'll, I'm going to talk about a lot of things tonight, but my, my confession here is um, like a very broad river, but not very deep. And you can dig in as deep as you want, but you can do a lot of exciting things without knowing, certainly no math required, but I think you'll see that as we go on. I'm not an astronomical imager. I wrote down somebody's name who is, who was mentioned here earlier on. I don't see it there on my pad, uh, but I don't have the time or dark skies, patient skills, or interest in doing some of the long exposures, the beautiful long exposures that I'm glad other people do. I'm gonna show you things you can do with a video camera with exposures that are less than a quarter second. Um, and I break just about every piece of equipment I work on. So I'm not a do-it-yourselfer. I'm gonna show you things. This is not something you have to build up yourself. Uh, it's simple to get started. I think my favorite keystroke and command in Windows is edit undo uh, or control Z. And so on occasion in my life, I've wished I'd had that. Uh, but uh, I think you'll see there's not a lot to be done in terms of building, unless you care to. Um, if you're doing outreach and engagement, and I think a lot of the members here do from what I've heard, I think you'll find uh, some of the screens and, and um, especially live videos I'm going to show you uh, really are exceptional in capturing people's attention and also giving you a springboard to talk a little bit more about the science. Uh, and if you're mentoring, the same thing goes. So this is a little frivolous. I'm not part of the cool crowd, but there are about 10,000 amateurs doing what I'm going to show you tonight. So this isn't some, uh, you know, black swanny kind of tale, a leading edge. This is well-established uh, technique and science, uh, and you, you'll see as we go through. I'm going to talk a little bit about the science and the history here. Forgive me. Uh, we need to lay this groundwork so that everybody can uh, come along uh, for the ride. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton used a uh, 
uh, prism to split light into its component colors, you can also do that by bouncing light off a finely lined surface or even passing it through a finely lined grating. And we're going to look at that tonight. Fraunhofer, about, what, 200 years ago, uh, is credited with discovering a spectrometer and that it uh, could observe features on the sun. But the excitement started uh, with Bunsen about a half a century later. So Bunsen invented the Bunsen burner to burn a sample, put it through a prism, and look at the result. And he burned everything. He was a pyromaniac. And he cataloged all the spectra, which we'll be looking at in a moment, that he saw the different elements he was burning. He created that catalog, and it really served us going forward in the future decades, as we'll see, as well as centuries. Now, Kirchhoff on the right there was a, a co-researcher of his, a colleague. We're not going to get into a lot of details about what he was uh, uh, talking about in, in the various writings he did, but I want to show you one thing without getting too technical here. There are two different types of spectra that you can see. You can see this one has a standard rainbow in Roy G. Biv order, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And these have gaps in them, so they're absorption spectra. Whereas this one down here has a black background and has emission lines, which you get depends on things Kirchhoff talked about, but we won't, uh, the temperature of the gas on the star that's creating these gaps or these emission lines. And uh, it's we'll see both. And the interesting thing about these is that they really um, – are the same lines, whether they're absorption or emission lines, they're in the same position. So it doesn't really matter a lot for the purposes of understanding what we're looking at. Okay, so these spectra are like chemical fingerprints. You'll notice, for example, on this hydrogen that there's a line there that doesn't appear in helium. So, and in fact, the hydrogen lines are so commonly used that we name them the hydrogen bomber lines. There won't be a quiz on any of this later, although I'll be happy to answer questions until you, you <laughs> tug, me, tug me off the stage. And these lines, we've actually, like the uh, stars and constellations, given them names, Greek names, hydrogen, alpha, beta, and gamma. And we'll be hearing about those uh, ad nauseum in the next few minutes. So uh, this is a periodic table of spectra. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. You don't have to pull on your chemistry hat or worry about getting too deeply into this. But I wanted to show that there are, if I get my drawing lines right, there are the hydrogen alpha, beta, and gamma lines. And so, and they're very different uh, than they are for helium. Or, for example, also looking at lithium, it, it, what, your uh, cell phone batteries or your laptop uh, use lithium, and you can see the lines are different. So they really are fingerprints. So now we don't have to burn things these days. We can actually use just a gas tube that's heated. Now, because I can't see myself, I just trust that you can see this gas tube over here. It's just a glass tube with some metal probes on the end. Uh, and uh, they, uh, as you can see, the gas tube, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to burn down my basement with it. So now how do we get these spectra? Oh, I wanted to mention this also. This is just a little desktop spectrometer that we created a few years ago for educators, uh, for gas tubes uh, in a physics or chemistry or astronomy class. And we have a lot of those all over the country in both high schools uh, as well as universities. So we're going to jump around a little bit chronologically. Forgive me for that. In 1835, this French philosopher said the stars are just too far away to know what they're made of. But just several decades later, he was proved wrong by these people, Italians, uh, French, uh, uh, British. I was, I was going to say UKans, but that's not quite right. <laughs> so, you know, as knowledge changes, obviously, there are things that we come to know that we didn't know just several decades earlier. And sometimes I wonder in several decades what the science will be, or maybe 50 years where they'll go, yeah, they, you know, back in 2020, they didn't understand that at all. Let me turn off this gas tube. So, um, so far, all the examples of people I've shown you have been old white men. So, uh, it's only fair that I show you some of the women who don't get uh, discussed as often as they should. Annie Jump Cannon, you may have heard of, and her group of women computers 
were prohibited from accessing telescopes because of their gender. They ended up doing a fantastic job of analyzing these glass photographic plates of spectra and through their hard work, uh, creativity and brilliance really created a cataloging system that of course allows us to determine and discuss star types. Uh, Priyamvada Nataraja uh, is at Yale and she studies uh, black holes. Nancy Grace Roman was the first astronomer at NASA, got her PhD in the late 1940s. Uh, her vision was Hubble Space Telescope and she made it happen. Uh, we're of course very happy that happened. Elisa Quintana uh, studies exoplanets, uh, has discovered exoplanets in the um, Goldilocks region where their temperature isn't too cold or hot and we have liquid water, potentially life. And uh, Jedediah Eisler is at Dartmouth and she studies hyperactive black holes and uh, gravitational lensing uh, that's involved with those. So there are some women. Now this is a relatively new slide for me. Uh, and when I was researching it, it was like going down a rabbit hole. There are so many women in the field who haven't gotten uh, the exposure or the name uh, for the work that they've done and deserve. So I thought it would be, as I said, only fair to show them. A little bit more of science. Some of you may know this. Many of you may know it and be able to explain it better than I can. But the Bohr model of the atom, as some of you may re recall from your school days, has these orbits and electrons that can jump between orbits. And when they jump from a higher to a lower, I suppose I should go like that, they emit energy, which we may be able to see, like that purple line there when something jumps from this level of, what is it, five down to level two. Well, the same thing, if something jumps from level three to two, we get that line there. And final one to show you is from level four to level two is that hydrogen beta. So these are our hydrogen lines here. I mentioned earlier, hydrogen alpha, beta, gamma, like these beacon lighthouse lights that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, especially this hydrogen beta turns out to be very common. All right, so let's find my mouse and move on. So these are some example professional spectrograph. Uh, the one on the right uh, is from uh, Southern France, uh, the OHP observatory. Uh, and it discovered the first exoplanet spectroscopically, something that can't be done with amateur gear. Uh, we can talk about how it's done uh, maybe later in the Q&A if we have time. Here's the Hubble spectrograph being uh, serviced by the space shuttle. Uh, my grandson says that is not an astronomical instrument. He says that's a refrigerator. It's filled with beer and they're on the shuttle. They were real party animals at night. And you know, they get a lot of nights in 24 hours on the shuttle. They did. And We'll just leave that for now. Here's Dale Mace's setup, and you can see it can be a, a real tangle and an expensive tangle. It uh, need not be. The thing I like about this is over here, this uh, gas tube, neon tube, that has just been like shoved in <laughs> into its device there. And I really like that at the end, are the, you can see the pins for that tube. And I picture Dale with these alligator clips, high voltage, trying to clip on to get that tube to come to life. And you know it's high voltage, and you draw a spark. First of all, you get a shock, but you ruin you ruin your night vision if that should happen. But it need not be as complicated as this. I'm going to spend a lot of time showing you examples from this star analyzer grading tonight. It costs about two hundred dollars. It has um, basically inch and a quarter threads and threads onto most devices, and we'll see some examples of that in just a moment. Here's the first example. The star analyzer is threaded onto the uh, end of a DSLR, and there are our beloved hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, and hydrogen gamma lines. These lines are formed as the light escapes the star, goes through the outer atmosphere, and because of those electrons jumping up and down, uh, th uh, some energy is on occasion absorbed and we have gaps in the spectrum. Notice that this camera does not have any tracking. It makes it considerably harder here uh, because you need, again, like any sort of drift imaging to get things aligned right. And uh, in fact, well, what kind of drift imaging can you do that's, that's anything but spectroscopy? So I don't recommend, it's also small aperture. I don't recommend this approach, but I thought it's interesting uh, and wanted you to see how simple it can be. And some people do this. So on the upper left here is uh, an example of a DSLR, a little bit zoomed in because I wanted to show you this black adapter there, which we sell that threads onto the lens cap threads of the camera and then provides an inch and a quarter thread here. 
Uh, you can piggyback this on a telescope. And the advantage of using a DSLR standalone like this is that the light goes through the grating first before it goes through the lens. It's called an objective grating, and you get higher resolution images even though you've got small apertures. Some amateurs actually stop down their telescopes so that they can do this kind of imaging with an objective grating. Uh, over here is a, you know, a typical Fitz camera. The camera need not be color, need not be mono. Uh, can be a video camera, DSLR, most any camera. On the lower right there, we've got an example of uh, this is just an imaging source video camera. In many cases, you can just thread the grating right on to the camera. And on the lower left, uh, we have an example of a filter wheel. We'll talk a little bit more about mounting uh, in, a, in a little bit. So when we take a step up by an order of magnitude in price, we now have devices that have a slit. They're much higher resolution and they're more difficult to use because you have to acquire your target and track on 20 microns or whatever the slit size is. Almost nobody, I think like maybe one in 100 or one in 200 starts out with these devices. There are actually do-it-yourself 3D printed devices available now uh, that um, uh, do pretty well. I don't have one on the slide and I will the next talk I give. So um, here's a star analyzer piggybacked on a telescope and you can see at the bottom there one of these high-end devices. Every spectrum I show you tonight, except uh, if I call out differently, will be done with a star analyzer. So I'm not going to, uh, hopefully not confuse you by showing you some high-end spectra and low-end spectra without pointing out the differences. Okay, thanks for your patience. We've gotten past all that foundation we need to build up. So when we take a star's light and go through the grating, we get a rainbow that we can capture on our camera sensor. Here's our first example that's really pretty, pretty, <laughs> I was going to say hot diggity dog, and then I was going to say kick butt, but just, I'll probably overuse the term tonight, amazing. So each of these is a different spectrum captured at a different time. Uh, these were captured by uh, Torsten Hansen. You can see his name down here with an, uh, about an eight inch Newtonian and an imaging source video camera. So these stars are in temperature order, hotter stars at the top in OB a fine G KM order. So there's the B stars, A's, F's, K's and M's as we go down. So look at those differences right out of the gate. Clearly, those cooler stars at the bottom have something different going on. Notice these wide bands down, you know, for some reason, uh, Google Meetings is hiding my mouse sometimes, which is okay. Just makes me a little confused. See those gaps down there, those bands? You don't see those on these hotter stars up here. And those bands, and I'm going to tell you everything I know about them, because I don't want you to think that I've got a lot of depth in this, because otherwise when we get to Q&A, it'll become evident at that time. Those bands are, are a molecule, titanium oxide. On these relatively cooler stars, a molecule like that can survive, even though it's very hot, it's not so hot to burn it up. The other more interesting thing on this is this region down here. This is at around 4,800. This is our hydrogen beta line. Notice that it differs across the different temperature stars. This one in particular is the darkest and widest, and that's on a type A star. So this is that hydrogen transition when the electron drops from level four to level two. So these stars up here, these B stars, are too hot, and the electrons just get, when they're being bumped up to levels, by the addition of energy from the star's burning process, they just go right past that level four. Uh, and these stars down here, many of the electrons never make it up to level four because the stars aren't hot enough. So as I said, right away, we can see in a very qualitative way, the differences in stars uh, and the predominance of lines uh, that allow us to study and identify those star types that uh, the computers uh, came up with. So I'm going to put a, a crosshair up here. And here you can see in the crosshair, right where those uh, crosshairs intersect, maybe you can see there's a little bit of dimming there. But you know, if I was to submit a research paper, not that I do, but if I was, and I was to say, yeah, we use the Hubble Space Telescope and we observed a little bit of dimming in that robin egg blue area, that's not science, right? It wouldn't be accepted. So what we have to do is convert this qualitative data to quantitative data. And we do that by plotting the intensity. 
So here the star is what? Narrow and very bright. So this peak is narrow and very break, bright. And that's a, a traditional star pattern that we'd see with, you know, full width, half maximum and Gaussian shape and so forth. And then this, if we look at this thing, it's dim and gets brighter, brighter, brighter and dimmer, 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 which is why this is shaped like that. But the exciting thing about this graph is now we can see that dip in intensity in the robin egg blue very clearly. Now we're doing science. We can study the width of the full width half maximum of that dip, where it's located. Does it change in time? How does it compare to other stars or this star at different times? Now we can do science. So how do we get these graphs. So my story is about 10 years ago, I wanted to do some science. I got a grading. I took it out in my backyard here in Seattle, about three miles from Pike Place Market on a Saturday night in August. I came in at midnight with some video recordings. I had grass stains on my blue jeans because it was Vega in August. So I'm climbing around on the ground, capturing it. The next morning, I tried to get a graph like this out of my data and I was unable to. I was using various shareware that existed that I downloaded, and I got so frustrated, literally. And I mean, these days you have to say literally, literally, <laughs> literally, I gave up because it was I couldn't do it, and it was too hard. The software was crashing. Half of it was in French. There was no manual. Uh, it, it just didn't meet the standards that we've grown accustomed to in uh, commercial software, and. I gave up. I told my wife, I'm not having fun. I'm supposed to be having fun. This is a hobby. And I threw the box in the drawer. It kept bugging me, though, because I really wanted to do this. So a couple of weeks later, I decided, OK, on Saturday, I'm going to write just a little bit of code. I've been developing code uh, since the 60s that, uh, yeah, really. And uh, I'll just generate this graph. You know, and I did that Saturday and Sunday. I had my graph, which this is. And now, 10 years later and 5, 10, 12,000 hours later, the software is almost done. My wife keeps asking, all right already. It should be done. I want to have dinner at a decent hour. So um, I want to show you the software, not to walk you through yet another software demo. It's, it's a little later there where you are, and I don't want to put you all to sleep. But what I do want you to see is how easy it can be to capture these spectra, because I think one of the obstacles to all of us getting involved in a new activity is, I don't want to learn a new piece of software. So on the left here, we have an image. I happen to be using a color camera here because it makes it easier to intuitively see what's going on. There's our Roy G. Biv spectrum coming off that star. This is from that first night out that I did. Now, all we have to do is, and this could be a Fitz image, could be a bitmap, JPEG, raw image, a live video. Bracket in the region I want to study. And then over here, we've got the graph. That's the same intensity graph we saw a moment ago. See that gap there? There's that dip there. Now, now comes the challenge. Now it is big deal. Well, how do I know what those dips are? How do I do science here? So remember I mentioned Bunsen created this catalog of all these fingerprints, of all these specter of different elements. Well, built into the software is a catalog, and we can come down here and say, show me where the hydrogen lines would be if the, our red data had them. And look, we've got dips going through quite a few of those points. It's not particularly well calibrated, but there we can see hydrogen beta, hydrogen gamma, and there's hydrogen alpha. So now we have pretty good empirical evidence by those matches that we're actually observing with a backyard telescope and a video camera, the hydrogen absorption lines of Vega. It's remarkable. Even this first step is remarkable. We can make it prettier by adding color to it. And because this is actually a frame from a video, let's start that video playing. Now the image is jumping around a little bit because of our scene changing. So over here, we've got some jumping around also. Now, uh, this is, uh, we can stack the data uh, in real time, which I just turned on. You'll see this stabilize. Some of those features get deeper and clearer to see. So that's all I want to show you in the software right now. And I, let's stop that for a moment. The only thing I'd ask you is, in your mind's eye, just take a look at what I've bracketed in here, because I want to, <coughs> in a little while, show you this again. So this is a Vega spectrum, and you can see the hydrogen lines uh, showing up uh, with those reference lines. Okay. 
<laughs> so let's uh, minimize that and come back to our presentation, which is there. If you're not seeing my presentation again, I hope you'll let me know. So here's a demonstration done at a huge public outreach. This is the kind of thing I was mentioning. This happens to be in Marseille in France. Uh, you can see their Department of Physique. I think this just betrays how uh, how culturally centric and ignorant I am. If I This is only the second time. It will be the last time I make this joke. I guess uh, Department of Physique, they must be uh, bodybuilders working on their physique. This is a great image because whether it's uh, on an overhead like this or whether uh, it's uh, on a, a laptop display, uh, especially if it's a live video playing, uh, it really is fascinating to people. This is actually a gas tube they're showing here, not a star. So here's an example of a wider field done with a DSLR. There's a star there. And then over here, we can see some emission lines from that star. This star here has some absorption lines like we saw in my software. Okay, so when Janet Simpson sent me this spectrum, some years ago, I have a confession to make to the group. I couldn't remember what a wolf a star was. There may be some of you in the audience who are in the same predicament I was. Even though I'd read about it, I'd read about wolf a stars probably half a dozen or a dozen times. But, you know, things do go in one ear and out the other. Well, Wikipedia is our friend. And a wolf a star is a massive late stage star. A lot of the outer shell has been dissipated. And we can see down towards the core of the star. So what the spectrum shows when we graph it are some carbon emission lines. And these lines like there and there and there, you remember of course stars burn their way through the elements one step at a time. This star has worked up the carbon and we're actually seeing that with a DSLR and a mechanical tractor. So this surprises people that this is possible. Not only amateurs are surprised, but I've set my, my equipment up at uh, professional conferences with my laptop on the hood of my car outside the portico at, at uh, motels and hotels in relatively urban settings. And it's always a little nerve wracking because these sometimes are, you know, Hubble researchers who are coming out the door. And, you know, I'm a knuckle dragging programmer. And so, but when I show them this, you know, they're sort of casual. I say, oh, what do you got there? And, I, and, I'll, and many of them have never actually seen a telescope capturing a spectrum and had no idea this, let alone what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes, is possible. So if we look at an extended rather than point source object, it looks like that. This is the only extended object that looks good with a slitless grading. You can see, again, the object itself. This object really only has two colors, so it's relatively interesting. But with a traditional spectrum that had that Roy G. Biv continuum, they'd all be muddled on top of each other, and you wouldn't be able to see much. But we, as I said, we can see the hydrogen alpha and the ionized oxygen there. So let's look at an extended object that is viewed in a slit spectrometer. You don't get much more extended than M42, right? So we can see the same emission features we were seeing previously, ionized oxygen, even though this is the beginning of stellar lives instead of the end, we can see our hydrogen and our, ion and our oxygen. So this, again, requires a slit spectra, but it's certainly possible. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second because I'm going to ask the group, uh, I'm going to try anyway. Uh, there we go. Uh, I'm ask the group, uh, if anybody is interested in um, sharing their first experience observing M42, if so, just hover your mouse and unmute yourself. You know, what kind of telescope were you using and what was your experience? What did it look like? Does anybody want to uh, volunteer to share that? It's okay if you don't. There won't be a quiz. I won't challenge you on anything you say. Sometimes it's fun to hear other people's experience when they were newcomers in the field. Uh, anyone? Bueller, anyone? Okay. So since we're not getting any answers there, unfortunately, you are going to be subjected to my story, which is very fast. And that is uh, after I share my screen again, and I need to see how to do that, present now, uh, entire screen. And there we go. Thank you for tolerating that interruption. You should be seeing my screen now, but it hasn't changed. So let me try again. Entire screen. And we select the window and click on share. There we go. So my first view of M42 was in the early 90s, uh, just before Shoemaker Levy 9. I had no idea uh, anything about astronomy, except I wanted to see this collision. 
Um, I went out at a star party in Denver in an urban setting. And it's fun to remember when you didn't understand something, how you looked at the world. And I walked onto that observing field and I saw all these, to me, they were those cannons like you see in the circus that people get shot out of. I didn't know they were Dobbs. I had no idea. I queued up at a Dobb uh, being um, run by somebody like many of you explaining what they were seeing uh, to these newcomers like me. And I was all excited. They were enthusiastic. This was going to be just stunning. And I got up to the eyepiece and I was really disappointed. It was a smudge. It was a mono sludge. There was no color. There was no texture. There was nothing. I bet some of you had a similar experience. But here's the deal. You, like me, probably go back and still look at M42. Now, certainly part of the reason you go back is because you've gotten better at averted vision. So now you know, you know how you can uh, you know, get a little more detail with averted vision like this. But more importantly and seriously, now you understand what you're seeing. And when you bring that understanding to the eyepiece, the experience gets that much richer. And the reason I mention that is I found as I've learned more of the science, a little more, not a lot, uh, that's come to me from spectroscopy, that my observing has become more interesting visually. Because now I understand a little bit more about why the stars are those colors and, and, and some of the background. So this is captured uh, also by Torsten Hansen that we saw a minute ago with that OBIA FGKM. See those gaps? This is, uh, you can see over on the left, Uranus and Neptune. And look at those deep dips. Those dips are the methane atmosphere absorption on these planets with a video camera. Now, professional astronomers, what, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, would have given their left leg, right, to be able to do this with such a small telescope, and now we can do it as amateurs. This is uh, our showpiece, Alberio, really quickly here, just to show you that the blue star has more energy over here in the blue end. That's why the graph goes up here and drops down into the cooler regions. And the uh, yellow star has uh, more energy, not as pronounced, over here in the yellow-red regions. Um, okay. So, in 1881, Henry Draper observed a comet. Heck, if Henry can do it, so can we. So, take that, Hank. So, this is a spectrum you can see done with a cannon and an 80 millimeter refractor. There's a string of gems and the swan bands. This was captured by a guy, Vikran Agnihotri, who lives in Rajasthan. He's a um, nuclear power plant engineer. Started out about six years ago knowing nothing, and now he's quite a sophisticated imager. Uh, of course, this is a little bit more recent of an object, and you can see the sodium emission line on Neowise. There's been a lot of fun amateurs have had observing these things recently. Any amateur who uses a C-clamp as part of their setup, that's my kind of observer. Of course, if it was me, I would have tightened that C-clamp too tight and I would buckle the housing and destroy the camera. But uh, uh, Robin Leadbeater didn't. There's a, a video camera with a star analyzer on it. Down here, we can see a single frame. So the meteor traveled that distance in that amount of time for one frame. And there was a bolide, an outburst right here. And we can see the spectrum that was captured. This is a little bit more of a, a sub-branch of spectroscopy. It takes a little more work. Uh, but uh, whatever floats your boat, and uh, it does his and many other people's. It's sort of fun. We're not going to talk a lot about it, the sun. We've heard tons of it over the last several years, except to point out that uh, one of the first star spectra that was captured was the sun just before totality. You just see a sliver, so you can use a slitless grating, and we discovered helium on the sun in, uh, in about 1865 before we discovered it here on the Earth. So uh, if you're into novae, uh, you can see that some novae, even with a DSLR, uh, have iron visible and others don't. And again, Doppler shift, uh, forgive me for this quick review. And that is for those of you who can't quite remember or aren't familiar with it, it's the pitch change that light and sound make as they're moving towards or away from you. So the common example is a train whistle coming through a station you're standing in, goes from high, low, right? towards you, towards you, towards you, high, low, away from you, away from you. Same thing happens with light. So if we were trying and expecting to capture a spectrum like that triplet right there, and instead of finding it there, we found it there, we know that was the Doppler redshift because the object was moving away from us. And the opposite, if it was bluer than what we expected, the object is moving towards us. Look at this great example a supernova, a type 1a supernova, which occurs without getting into the details uh, when two stars orbiting each other, uh, one dumps gas on the other. 
Um, and um, when you dump gas on something hot, you get an explosion. So there's a supernova in M101. There's a similar type 1A supernova photograph. That's not ours, uh, so to speak. But uh, you can see the shell, uh, that spherical form there, as the supernova is expanding. Well, David Strange in the UK captured this spectrum with less than 15 minutes of integration time with a 9-inch SCT. And there's the spectrum that he captured. Notice that deep dip. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, and the giants tell us that a type 1A supernova with two stars going around each other is going to have a very deep dip around 6,000 angstroms, and you can see that's what we've got down here, and it's ionized silicon. So, and those giants have created this great chart. So here's a type 1A supernova, these two stars going around each other. Look at that big dip that's down around 6,000. That's ionized silicon. Now, none of these other types of supernovas, right, these type 1 supernovas, uh, 1 Cs and Bs and 2s, these core collapse supernovas, where a star collapses on itself through a variety of means, none of them have as deep a dip of, of um, silicon, if at all. So this is how professionals identify type 1A supernova. Now, look what David did. It's really cool. We did this together. He noted the wavelength of that dip on the x-axis, and then he looked up what ionized silicon would be at rest. He could have referred to uh, Bunsen's catalogs if he uh, burnt beach sand, for example. Now, I couldn't remember the Doppler shift formula, but again, Wikipedia came to my assistance, and we were able to calculate the blue shift of that shell racing towards us because that dip isn't where we expected it. It's pretty amazing. So Martin, uh, excuse me, Adam Reese, who won the Nobel Prize in 2011 for work he and his team did before the turn of the century, was on the expanding, accelerating, expanding cosmological distances. <laughs> That's not quite a good sentence, but we'll stick with it. So they use type 1A supernovae as their standard candle. Somehow, I think his equipment was maybe a little bit more sophisticated than this. But in bang for buck, I bet this $200 grading on the, you know, tens of millions of dollars of telescopes that he was probably using. So what about the spectrum of a black hole? Now, of course, the light can't escape from the black hole, but the spiraling material matters that's coming into it is so moving so fast and gets so hot it does emit light. So uh, David Hayworth, uh, just south of us, I'm in Seattle. Um, he observed a 3C273, a quasar. There it is. I've never seen it myself. And the spectrum, and maybe you can see two little dots there. There they are, and there's the spectrum. Now, in the mid-1960s, Martin Schmidt was in his mid-20s. He was about 25 year old, years old. And he looked at this, and the reason I know this story is because there's a wonderful transcript of a great interview with him where he describes this discovery and the challenges, both technical, scientific, and emotional, that he faced. He's looking at these, these emission lines, and he cannot figure out what they are. They don't match anything. He, and at one point, fairly far into it, he, he frustrated. He says, okay, I'm just going to go back to basics. I'm going to eliminate that these can be hydrogen bomber emission lines like we saw in Vega. There's that screen I asked you to keep in your mind's eye, and there are the hydrogen bomber lines there, right? Alpha, beta, gamma, et cetera. And he looked at those and went, well, they really don't match these big lines here, those big peaks. There's nothing really matching. It's sort of a mess. There's no match. But they did match, as he figured out. It was the hydrogen bomber lines shifted an enormous amount towards the red which meant, using the Hubble constant and cosmological expansion, this object was enormously distant from us, two billion light years away. So we can use, this is done with, a, let's say, a modified security camera and an eight-inch SCT. And this, um, we can use that redshift and the Hubble constant to calculate the speed or the distance, depending on how you do it. What amazes me is that this light that's come from so far and taken so long to get to us, this light still has information in it 
that we can tease out with such simple equipment and learn something about that distant and no longer existent object, probably. Nothing ages as well as that in the universe that we know. That's a bold statement. I've never made it quite that way before. But few things, few or no things. Here's Martin Schmidt a few years ago. He's changed. Now, this again, uh, it's like throwing rocks in a glass house, you know, stones. Uh, you know, I shouldn't be here. At least he's got a full head of hair. I'm jealous of him, actually. So let's look at a couple more examples, and then we'll finish up. So, so far, we've been looking at these bomber features and other features, too. And don't say I didn't warn you, we'd see these features a lot. But let's look at, at how wide these features are. Uh, for example, let's just, uh, I'm just going to draw a line from the edge of this feature down to the bottom, just so we can look at how wide it is. You know, it's about, on this x-axis scale, about maybe 50 angstroms, maybe a little smaller. That's our resolution, approximately, of a star analyzer grading. What if we want to zoom in and look at the details of this hydrogen alpha feature? For that, we need a higher resolution uh, system, like the slit spectrometers uh, I mentioned earlier. And I'm going to show you one of those. Uh, the way we can do this is capture a spectra of an object we want to know, like Vega, we want to study, and an object that's not moving, like well, the moon. The moon isn't moving towards or away from us appreciably. And here's what that looks like. This is the hydrogen alpha line. In blue is the moon. And in fuchsia, that's, I'm not sure technically that's fuchsia. In fuchsia is vega. And look at the difference. And we're actually able to calculate the radial velocity fairly closely, closer than an order of magnitude, really easily. Now, notice that we needed resolution. It was sub-angstrom. There's actually a decimal point there. That's 0.67. So that's 0.67 on this scale. So you can see how far zoomed in we are. So I've got one more thing to show you, also a slip spectrum. And I've got um, this teaching aid. Now, because I can't see my preview, I'm going to move fairly far away so I make sure this is in view. It's a star that's spinning really fast, right? So this edge is coming towards you. So there's redshift for that light. This edge is moving away from you, so there's blue shift all the way around. <laughs> Toward you is blue shift, away from you is red shift. So what that means, what happens, oh, and the final thing is the light here isn't being affected by the rotation, right? It's not really moving towards you or away from you when light is coming off the center of the planet. So what that means is instead of getting a nice sharp dip, some of the light that would normally be right at that dip uh, has been smeared out to the blue <coughs> and smeared out to the red. And this peak is shorter. Let's see what that looks like. See that blue there? There's that squashed, so to speak, broadening. In, in Fuchsia, we can see Vega that's not spinning very fast. But because Altair is spinning fast, we see that shrinking. Okay couple quick uh, items to mention. How do you get started? Star analyzer grading I've already talked about. As I mentioned, almost any camera, color, video, DSLR, mono, whatever. Fits camera, cooled fits. Now, the other thing is this distance from the grading to the sensor isn't critical. It's not like focusing. But if it's too far away, the spectrum has too much time to spread out and doesn't fit on the sensor or is too dim. And if it's too close, the spectrum doesn't have enough time to spread out uh, so that we can see those gaps in it. So uh, which, which you knew how, to, how you mount this, oftentimes you just use the standard nose piece on the, on the camera. Sometimes you need a spacer. Uh, and there's a calculator on our site. And I help a lot of amateurs who come to me, uh, and there's a click, clickable button on our site. You know, Tell me what, what hardware you're using, and I'll run our calculator and show you what you need. Finally, software, if I was a bidder, a better, a bidder, yeah. If I was a better salesman, I would have mentioned my software's name uh, repeatedly. I didn't. RSpec stands for real-time spectroscopy, as you see down there on the bottom. And um, this is some of the freeware that's out there, uh, which I and others uh, started with sometimes uh, that I find I had trouble with, as do others. On the other hand, it's incredibly powerful software, uh, and a lot of people use it. 
Um, it's uh, difficult to learn and difficult to use in many people's opinion. So a um, couple more slides and we'll be done. So the age old, age old, the problem that I mentioned earlier is when you get started, how do you know what all these dips are? I'm, I'm not an astrophysicist. So one of the books that's on there on the screen is this wonderful book by uh, Richard Walker and uh, Mark Tripstein. The cool thing about this book is they actually they show you spectra and they call out what you're seeing. Unfortunately, that's not a good enough uh, help for somebody like me. I don't know the significance of nitrogen or oxygen, but they also have diagrams and lots of pros aimed at us as amateurs, not professionals. These are great, both these books as well as others that exist. Uh, my software is uh, free for 30 days, and the good news is maybe you never plan to do this. You can still download the software for 30 days. Also on the site is a video of a workshop in person I gave to about 100 AVSO members a few years ago at the SAS conference in LA. And with the sample data that's also on that page, tonight or tomorrow, you could be walking through processing spectra following the videos. The site also has a ton of tutorial videos. There's no 400 page manual to read. The AVSO has jumped into spectroscopy, both Arnie and uh, Stella, uh, his uh, successor, professional astronomers. They know the importance of it. I'm speaking to the AAVSO later this month, as well as at their general meeting uh, in October. Uh, they have an online database now that's growing. And as a result of that, we'll see more pro-am collaboration. Uh, there's not as many opportunities as we'd like, but they're coming. Finally, over the last 55 minutes, I ran over a little bit. I apologize. As well as the last two or 300 years, we've learned a lot, right? This is uh, Fraunhofer. That was supposed to be a square. Uh, Fraunhofer, as you may recall, long ago before we dove in, um, he uh, uh, is credited with the first spectrometer as well as observing star spectra. And uh, Kirchhoff was a buddy of uh, Bunsen's, and uh, he formulated some rules to help us understand what we were seeing. I'd like to thank all of you for your patience with me, for smiling and maybe laughing at some of my jokes. Uh, and I also want to tell a really brief story, uh, and that is I was doing outreach at the Pike Place Market. I've been chased out of the Pike Place Market here in Seattle because they don't let anybody just set up because otherwise there'd be musicians and uh, magicians and buskers on uh, every five feet. So I was, I was like across the street and I was showing the sun with my Lunt telescope and there were some other people near me hanging out. Not street people in the sense that they slept on the street, but people who hung out on the street. They, they made me a little nervous, you know, and, and uh, so, at one point, one of them came over to me, and, and now I was really worried. I just, I wasn't comfortable with the interactions, which betrays us, again, some of my biases and economic uh, issues, maybe more than anything. He came up to me and he said, can I look? And I went, yeah, sure. I probably didn't grimace like that. And he looked and I'm doing my spiel, sunspots, size of the earth, prominences, all those things. You know what I'm talking about. And he looked up at me. And he said, and he was interested. I mean, he asked a question or two and was humming and going, wow. He said, how did you learn this? And at that moment, the gulf between my experience and his and the opportunities that I've had and you all have had, if you're here listening to this talk, you've had opportunities and you've taken advantage of them. That's true. And it was a, it was a moment for me to reflect on paying it forward and paying it backwards. I wanna thank the club for the outreach that I know you do and uh, really thank you and encourage all of you to do more because that giving back fills the heart and also is, in my opinion, something we have a responsibility to do. Again, I'd like to thank you and I'll be here, as I said, to answer any questions that you've got. Say, so, uh, Tom, this is Dave Faulkner. So, uh, the uh, the actual filter itself that you screw into the one and a quarter or, or one and a half inch eyepiece, yeah. uh, wh where is that available at? Uh, we sell that also. It's sell on our site. Yeah, we ship same day typically. It takes two, three days to get there. Good. Gotcha. Thanks for making that. Sure. That's, that's, uh, th this was really fa fa fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited. I, 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 I'm very likely going to get into this. That's so. my goal. I mean, to me... <laughs> The only drawback to, to what I do these days is because I'm a businessman and I sell stuff, I think everybody may look at my enthusiasm as, as if it's a little tainted by shucksterism. You know, I just want to sell things. Someday I won't be in business, decades from now, I hope. 
And then people will really take my word for it that it is as exciting and amazing if it's your cup of tea. So I'm sure. glad at least I touched you, David. And maybe there's other people who are interested or just have questions. Yeah. Dave, there's a question in the chat. Uh, what are the two books? Uh, so the, there is on my site, there's, uh, I won't show it on the screen, but there's on the top menu bar on our spec Astro uh, is a menu option called links. And if you scroll down there, the books are even linked to on Amazon. Oh, thank you for posting that. Uh, they're, they're, by, they're by Richard Walker. And uh, uh, truth in advertising, I, I get, you know, and some of you know this, as a as a uh, affiliate, meaning I refer people to Amazon to buy things, I get a, a cut if you buy something. I think in 10 years, I've made literally 90 Actually, maybe even $30. <laughs> yeah. But what's, interesting, what's really fun, really, it is, I don't know where the 90 came from. It's definitely under 40. And the interesting thing is about being an affiliate is, I don't know how they figure it out, but if anybody buys something during that visit that they initiated with your link, you get a cut of the sale. So I I made like four cents on a My Little Pony uh, little doll. <laughs> <laughs> so... But yeah, there's lots of books uh, and there's others which, uh, this is a, a little more technical in terms of the background, but there's other uh, Patrick Moore series books that uh, explain a little more about the science about and the history uh, that are also good entry points. What else? And and this this was recorded, so you could go back into the recording and see the books uh, as he displayed them in his, in his uh, uh, slide presentation. Thank you. You should create an AL observing program for this. There actually is one uh, that just came up the other uh, a few months ago. Somebody brought it up. Somebody here in Washington created it. I, it seemed like it was a little bit harder than what I would have come up with, but it's a good program. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it, I haven't really followed it. I don't know if anybody's into it, uh, but uh, you could be the first. Um, one question that people sometimes ask is, well, you know, how dim a star can I image with this stuff? Just really briefly. When you're imaging, or even visually, well, let's talk imaging. When you're imaging, all of the photons from the star fall on a handful of pixels, right? Depending on your full width, half maximum of your setup. But when you take some of that light and split it out into a rainbow, now you're spreading the same total number of photons across hundreds of pixels. So you lose five or six magnitudes. Now, it's not as big a bummer as you might think, because as it turns out, you don't need a lot of photons. And there's tons. So suppose you can image down to 15 now. This means you can image down to 9 or 10 for spectroscopy. And there's plenty of things that you can observe at that level. Now, is my video is still showing because there was one thing I forgot to show you. My wife always says to dress for success. And uh, <laughs> now this is, now there you can see is the hydrogen alpha there. Yeah. I, know, I know it's a mess right now. And I'll tell you, the problem is, my salon's not answering their phone. <laughs> can't get through. And, and I, I, the, the real problem is if you look down to those roots, there's like a lot of gray showing up. Now, I know some of you know what I'm talking about from your households. That gray down there, but this is a little hot to wear all the time. But uh, again, it's a nice gag. What else? Thanks, Tom, um, for this very enthusiastic presentation. That was wonderful. Thanks. Um, so I have a sort of a practical question, which is um, uh, how do you calibrate the position on the, you know, the spread out spectrum on your image with, with the wavelength? That is a wonderful question. And that's why I'm gonna share my screen right now. You should be able to see my software. Yep. So good. When you start imaging, things look like that with this axis being pixels, right? Because it's just, you know, these, this image. So my camera was 1300 pixels across on this. And what you're asking is how did I get this into wavelength? How do I know that that's a hydrogen alpha or a beta or whatever it is? By the way, that's a water line there. That's the absorption of water in the atmosphere. It's sort of fun to know that's there. So it's really simple and it's easier than you might have expected primarily for two reasons. First of all, these gratings are linear. Linear grading means that the light gets spread out the same amount no matter what its color is uh, proportionally. So that means, for those of you who uh, remember or even work with today the math, 
That just means I need y equals mx plus b. Well, the second thing that makes it easy is we know that this is zero angstroms. That's the light, that's this light here, of the star that went straight through the grating without getting deflected because the grating isn't 100% efficient in deflecting light. So without getting into a lot of the details, um, we all we have to do is tell the software two points in their wavelength. And we know this point, that's zero angstroms, undeflected light. So now the second point, this is the only one that's like, well, how do we figure that out? The way we do it is we look at a type A star that has a very pronounced hydrogen beta line just to the left of the peak. So this is the, um, this is really the bootstrap. So we look at that wavelength, you can see the little balloon help 735, that's this pixel value here. When I put that in here, when I click apply, this axis is now gonna be showing in angstroms. That's the M in Y equals MX plus B. So that's how we calibrate. Um, one other thing, as long as I have this, uh, does that answer your question? Yes, it does, but you have to also answer, why are you using angstroms instead of nanometers? That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to it, except traditionally astronomers in the visual light range use angstroms. I mean, as if we're not saddled badly enough by not using the international units in all of our lives. I mean, all right, I we still stick with, with magnitude. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Yeah, you. I mean, you can switch the software to nanometers and everything will work fine. But um, this, for some reason, uh, in the visual range, they've never made the switch. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you, as long as I've got this graph up here, is I want to show you a professional spectrum of a type A star like Vega, which this is. Uh, and the software has a reference library uh, of professional spectra that have been cleaned up and fixed. So I'm going to show you the spectrum of a type A star like Vega. Well, the one thing that's sort of cool is you can see this blue professional spectrum does have a dip right where we expected one there. And there's a really deep dip on that hydrogen beta. And in fact, these line up and those. So, so we have some correspondences, but there's also a big difference. Their dip keeps going up as if this was a Planck curve. Whereas our data goes down, that intensity as we get into the blue over here drops. And that's because our camera loses sensitivity in the blue. Now there's an easy way to convert our data, which is being affected by our camera and the grading and, and the extinction in the atmosphere, uh, if we're too close to the horizon, so that it has this shape. Uh, and once you've done that once, uh, you don't have to uh, you don't have to uh, do it again as long as you're in same, similar observing conditions. Uh, the reason I well, I'm just going to keep going instead of taking that little detour. What I want to show you uh, finally here, and then I'll stop sharing my screen, is this video of Albireo A and B. The dimmer one there is Albireo B. The software is set up to automatically do that calibration I just described so that the curve reflects the energy from the star and doesn't have our camera wimping out in the red. <laughs> Albireo B is a, coincidentally a type B star. It's very hot. And look how more of the energy is over here in the blue end of the spectrum rather than in the red end. Now I'm going to start this video because this is real time under the stars. You're going to see in about five seconds the mouse come alive and I'm going to move those orange lines to the other Albireo, which is a cool type K star. Look how most of its energy, because it's only 4,000 degrees Kelvin, most of its energy is over in the red end. So this kind of thing you can do in real time. This is not, however, the way that amateurs uh, determine uh, star temperature. Uh, they use the, the prevalence of different elements to do that. Um, all right, so I'll stop sharing here and shut up and uh, wait for more questions. Well, good. If there aren't any, oh, good. I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah, I was just about to ask about Albireo, but you beat me to it. So that was a really fascinating view to see them side by side. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. Uh, I, again, I want to thank the club uh, and for all of all the work you do in outreach and for inviting me tonight. Uh, I'm going to uh, bug out and let you all uh, do what you do. Uh, it's probably a um, uh, uh, heated topic. I, I might mention, so I've given, uh, since June, I've given 35 presentations to clubs and uh, about 250 over the last six or seven years using WebEx. 
that back then I was I was giving it to clubs that were assembled. Uh, and now it's much easier because everybody's familiar with online sessions. Um, I, I wanted to, again, forgive me for mentioning this, to encourage you to think about using Zoom because as you as you recognize, a lot of this, who was it? Was it a woman with a TR in her name, Trina, I think. As she mentioned, the nice thing about being on Zoom is you can see all the people's video and it's not generally a bandwidth problem. And it becomes more of a social event instead of just seeing a handful of people and then disembodied voices. So give that some thought. I'm sure you've got great reasons for using uh, this here, uh, Google. But anyway, uh, uh, I'm, there she is. Thank you, Trina, for popping in. Now I've got your name right. Um, and thank you for uh, making that comment earlier. Uh, and uh, that gave me the doorway through which I just walked. And I'm now going to flee by running out and closing the door behind me. Well, Tom, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. This is really fascinating. I'm sure there's a lot of us who, who, will, uh, who will follow up and uh, maybe start getting involved in, in the spectroscopy. So good. you're welcome. Uh, it's great. Evening. Great. Good. Yeah, thank you very much. And that actually wraps up our, our, uh, our meeting for tonight. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, and have a really great evening. Uh, maybe I'll see some of you up at Long Lake. And I guess that's about it for tonight. Thanks a lot. Yep. You know, Thanks, we, Dave. Pe we peaked out at about 69 people, it looked like. So that was a really that's, good turnout. I think that's a, that's a new high for us. That's great. Thank you very Thank much. You, okay. Bye. Stop recording. There we go.